but we meet four times a week. Of course, Sunday morning here at 9 a.m., and then we meet through the week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, right now, we're currently engaged in a study of the Book of Romans. We go verse by verse in our studies here, where each class is different and presents a new topic for us. Uh, you're distributed on Sunday the Grace and Actions, and those provide you a summary of the teachings that we have here. It's a it's a great tool, not only to keep you abreast of the teachings, but it's also that you can distribute it to your friends and so forth, telling them a little bit about our ministry. The Grace and Actions have a staple portion there. That's our main programs and the reviews and so forth. The insert that's in there pulls out. That is today's notes, and you can follow along with today's teachings if you'd like. Um, all of our classes are one hour in length. And like I said, we're currently involved in Romans. You can go through any of our previous studies that we've had. We've been through the book of Genesis, 1 John's, Ephesians. There's several of them, and those are listed on our website at www.prayerviewchristian.org. Um, and those contain all of our teachings that we've had across the past. They also contain the audio series of all the classes that we teach right now. Um, also, uh, we have a Wednesday evening prayer meeting. That's held at 630s on Wednesdays prior to the start of Wednesday's evening class. And that's a great time for us to assemble together as a corporate union to voice our prayers to the Father. We also uh, just want to make it known that we have tapes available from Thursday night's session with Gary Horton and so forth. Those are available if you'd like. And uh, we also need to say happy birthday to Rick because he had a birthday yesterday. So. How old are you, Rick? How old are you? There you go. We'll... Allison's birthday is on Tuesday, so we'll, we'll remember that, too. <laughs> we'll take our grace offering at the close of our service this morning. We only do that once a week here. And before we begin today's service, we need to take a few moments to prepare ourselves for what the Spirit has to say to the church. We know through 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins before the Father, he's faithful and just to forgive us with the result that he purifies us from all unrighteousness. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let us take a few moments for silent prayer. Heavenly Father, let us give thanks to you for this day that we may assemble together as the body of Christ to worship you and learn more of your plan for our lives. With the help of the Holy Spirit, may this service enlighten us to the great love that has been directed toward us. May we be challenged to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. We give thanks to you for every spiritual blessing that you have given us and your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your perfect character and nature. Thank you for giving us the gift of your Son that brings about our so great salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, and the eternal life. May Christ's victory at the cross bring about a renewing of our minds, and may we realize that we are no longer slaves to our sin nature. We are alive in Christ and live to bring the honor and glory to his name. May our walks in life reflect his mind and thinking and bring others to his saving knowledge. We thank you for the blessings and the answered prayers of this ministry. Thank you for the provision of this building in which to meet on a consistent basis and study your word. We thank you for the dedication and devotion of the individuals that you've raised up that operate within their spiritual gifts, giving of their time, talents, and treasures to further your kingdom. And, Father, we thank you for the gift of our pastor and his faithfulness to his studies, his teaching, and his prayers. We pray for his spiritual and temporal needs, and we ask that you might grant him encouragement and keep him protected from the attacks of the enemy. Would you continue to open up doors of opportunity for this ministry to proclaim your gospel message to all those who are in this area? And, Father, we lift up our prayers for this great nation. We thank you for the privileges and the freedoms that we have in these United States. We lift up our leaders, our president, vice president, and their members of cabinet, 
and we ask that you impart wisdom and moral courage to them in leading this country. And would you continue to raise up individuals positive to your word and with establishment principles. And Father, we pray for the men and women that serve throughout our military service. We ask that you grant each one of them strength and courage in their battles, provide them their, their necessary logistics, and that you give them victory over the enemy. And we ask that your hand might be upon our class this morning. May grace be given to the communicator that your word is spoken with accuracy and clarity, presented boldly and with power, brings about reverence and respect for you, and delivers your full counsel. May those of us in the audience listen with strict attention to your spoken word. May we be offered a humility and objectivity as we consider these passages and principles, and may we all be sensitive to the guidance that the Holy Spirit provides. Let us be thoughtful and consider of others and do nothing to disturb or distract those who are serious students of the Word of God. And as a result of these things, may grace and knowledge increase, and may we develop a deeper appreciation for you and for your Son's work on this cross. It is because of his merits on the cross that these prayers are offered. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen. Would you all rise, please? Uh, this uh, song is uh, in the songbook, of course. It's called Give Thanks. And uh, you can look at the table of contents. It'll show you what page. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ the Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ the Son. And let the weak say I am strong Let the poor say I am rich Because of what the Lord has done for us And now let the weak say I am strong Let the poor say I am rich Because of what the Lord has done for us Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. Give that. We give thanks, we give thanks. Maybe see it, good job. You've got to love with God's love. 
you've got to love with God's love. You've got to love with God's love. You've got to love with God's love. You've got to love. You got to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. You got to love no great love can one man. life for his friends oh never love with word or tongue but with deed and truth that's God's love and love does no wrong to one's neighbor and love covers all sins and transgressions And love conquers all And is forgiving That's God's love Walk in love As the Lord loved you When he gave up himself To redeem your soul This same love That was at the cross We should have for each other That's God's love And no love, no wrong To one's neighbor And love conquers all Sins and transgressions And love conquers all And is forgiving That's God's love You've got to love the Lord your God With all your heart and with all your soul And with all your mind, with all your strength And your neighbor as yourself you got to love and love just no wrong To one's neighbor And love covers all sins and transgressions. And love conquers all and is forgiving. That's God's love. That's God's love. That's God's love. That's God's love. love. Uh, this next song is called The Love of God, and uh, this also, also as well is in the uh, songbook. If you like to follow along with the songbook, if you can't read the screen. <clears throat> and by the way, the, the person who wrote this song, is, his name is uh, Frederick Lehman. And back around 19, around the First World War, 1915, I think, 16, 17, around that area, uh, he was from Iowa. He was born in Iowa. And he wrote this song uh, when he was between jobs. He was a pastor from Iowa. And he wrote this in the beginning of the first, the 20th century. And it's pretty interesting. Great song. God. 
fun is greater fun than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. My guilty pen, my down with care, God gave His Son to win. His erring child, He's reconciled and pardoned from His Could we with the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made were every star on earth a quail and every man a scribe I take to write the Drain the oceans dry Nor could the school Contain the home Though stretched from sky To sky prep school teachers you guys can go and for those of you who might be visiting we have a prep school downstairs for the young people and they get a lesson taught down there too in candy I think All right, uh, good morning to all of you. Could you turn your Bibles to the book of Romans? Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Thank you, for uh, Michael, for doing the announcements and, the, and uh, the opening prayer. You always do a great job. And also, Eric, for doing the slides for me uh, this morning. It's very much appreciated. And also, of course, Titus Thompson in the back. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge people when they, you know, they're doing stuff uh, to help out the, uh, the worship service. And uh, I know they do it uh, for the Lord, and I, I don't mean to embarrass them, but I do feel like I, I do have a responsibility just to show my appreciation to them, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. You ain't going to lose any rewards. Don't worry about that. It's nothing. <laughs> but I do th- have a responsibility to thank people who do stuff like that. And, and all of you guys that are working behind the scenes in the tape ministry, in the prep school, cleaning the church, the upkeep of the church, doing the finances in the church, praying for this ministry, it's... Very much appreciated and keep us in prayer. Okay, should be at Romans chapter 3, verse 10. We have a continuing our study of the book of uh, Romans. As Michael said in the announcements, uh, we do teach uh, verse by verse in the Bible. That's called expository 
a teaching of the Word of God. And uh, so what we do is we go through each book. And as Michael mentioned, we did, we've done the book of Genesis, 1 John, and Ephesians. And uh, we'll, when we did Philippians. We'll finish that off in the future. But all these things are available on CD, free of charge, tapes, free of charge on our website, free of charge. We don't charge for our teaching. And uh, this is a grace ministry. So as we've sent many times before, uh, nobody will be calling you up, bugging you for money. We just, uh, basically, it's up to you and the Holy Spirit what you give or what you, if you give at all. So it's not our business, the church. And uh, so the church has to operate in faith. And, and if we're doing God's will, then God will provide for the ministry. And he's done that up to this point. We've been here a little over six years now. But anyways, without further ado, let's uh, get right into our study of the, of the book of Romans. We're in chapter 3, and we're currently engaged in a study of the third part of the second major section of the book of Romans. Now, the first part, I remember in the original language, they did not have chapter verses and chapter, uh, chapter breaks and verse markings. That, that's not in the original Greek and the Hebrew. And someday I'll show you uh, many of the manuscripts when we go over canonicity again. But that was added, the, the, you know, the chapter divisions, the verse markings were brought in around the 1500s. And that was, it actually helps us or facilitates the study of the Word of God. So they're actually a good idea to do that. Uh, but that's why sometimes you see in, like in, in Hebrews the writer goes somewhere in the Psalms. And because it wasn't, there was no chapter divisions or verse markings in the original language. So uh, what they would do is they would use grammar and they would use, obviously the context uh, would t- tell you if there was a new a transition to a new paragraph in the original. Now we're currently engaged in a study of the third part of the second major section of the book of Romans. The first major section of the book of Romans was, of course, the introduction contained in the first 17 verses of chapter 1. Then, beginning in Romans 1.18, all the way to Romans 3.20, that's the second major section of the book of Romans, and it, uh, it basically uh, tells us of the universal need for the righteousness of God. Now, the third part of this second major section can be divided into four parts itself. First of all, we have, it can be treated like a courtroom trial. In Romans 3, 9, we have the entire human race brought before the Supreme Court of Heaven to answer to the divine indictment. That's the arraignment in Romans 3, 9, where Paul says that all are under the sin nature, the power of the sin nature. There's no one in the human race that is uh, not under the power of the sin nature when they come into this world. Only Jesus Christ is the only perfect human being there ever was. The second part of this courtroom trial is the indictment, and we're currently studying that. That's in verses 10 through 17, where the entire human race faces the charges of crimes against a holy God. The third part is gives us the motive. That's the motive for man's crimes against God in verse 18. And then lastly, we have the verdict, excuse me, in verses 19 and 20, where the entire human race stands condemned before a holy God. And as we've seen in the past, and we'll see again in the future, the first step in man's being justifi- justified before God, meaning accepted by God into his presence, to have an eternal relationship and fellowship with him, was to put the human race under his grace policy. Grace is all that God is free to do in imparting unmerited blessings based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So anyone who believes in Jesus Christ receives the grace of God, is appropriated the grace of God, and God is able to grace them out and treat them in grace and to give them every spiritual blessing in their heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So once God is condemned the human race, none, there's none righteous, no, not one, they're qualified for grace because grace is for the undeserving, the helpless and the hopeless, as we'll see. And then once we believe in Christ, which is non-meritorious, all the merit is in the object of our faith. The minute we do that, God, the Bible teaches, gives us his righteousness. And when he sees his righteousness in us, he declares us justified. That's why it says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. That means after God has made that decision, a perfect decision, he doesn't make dumb decisions. He doesn't make decisions he rescinds. Once he makes a decision, he could declares you justified. He can't come go back on that. So that's why one of the reasons why you could never lose your salvation because of any sin that you ever committed. Because all the sins in human history were uh, imputed to Christ on the cross, and he was judged for our sins, past, present, and future. So when you come to Christ, the issue is not your sins because he died for those sins. The issue is what do you think of Christ? And the minute you do that. You have the righteousness of God given to you. 
all the human race, every one of us was spiritually bankrupt when we came into this world. And that spiritually bankrupt condition is manifested in our thoughts and our words and our actions, which are sinful. And we see that uh, once we have uh, believed in Jesus Christ, God imputes to our spiritual bank account, bank account which we, we were bankrupt. He imputes his righteousness, so now we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of our union with Christ Jesus. And God sees that righteousness. He accepts what is his and therefore declares you righteous. And, his, and you'll be righteous forever and ever. Now, isn't that a freeing thing? You didn't earn it. I didn't earn it or deserve it. That's grace. It's for the undeserving and the helpless and the hopeless. So the verdict of the human race, it all, uh, that begins the whole process uh, of ju- uh, justification. So thus far, we have studied the arraignment of the human, entire human race in the courtroom of heaven, which is contained in Romans 3.9. And in this passage, remember, Paul states that both Jew and Gentile are under the power of the sin nature and thus under the power of the uh, under eternal condemnation. So we're all enslaved to the sin nature when we come into this world. And again, this is manifested in our thoughts, words, and our actions, which do not measure up to God's perfect divine standards. Don't compare yourself to other people. That's relative righteousness. But human righteousness ne- does not measure up to God's perfect righteousness. So you might want to compare yourself to other people and think you're better than other people. You might very well be more moral than some people. But the bottom line is, if you put the whole human race and compare them to a holy, perfect God, and in particular, the God-man, Jesus Christ, no one measures up. That's why people will go to the lake of fire, not because of their sins, because they rejected Jesus Christ and try to get into heaven according to their deeds, as it says in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And their human self-righteous works do not measure up to the perfect work of Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man. Now, in last Sunday, we began a study of this 13-count indictment brought against the entire human race by God. And again, that is contained in Romans 3.10 through 17. In this passage, remember Paul, he presents evidence under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> excuse me. He employs six of the Psalms and Isaiah chapter 59, verses 7 and 8. And he does this to present a 13-count indictment against the entire human race. And it, this demonstrates again that the human race is under the power of the sin nature, totally depraved and in need of salvation in the eyes of a holy God. Last Sunday we studied in Romans 3.10 the, the first of these charges and we saw in Romans 3.10 that Paul declares that there's absolutely no one in the entire human race that is righteous in the eyes of God. Remember the standards we have to measure up to. Perfect standards. And no one in the human race, I don't care if there's no Pope, there's no Mother Teresa, or your aunt, your uncle, your grandmother, your grandfather. We are all sinners in the eyes of God. Yours truly, Billy Graham, your favorite Bible teacher, we are all sinners. We are all, there's none righteous, no, not one. And Paul's emphatic when he says that, as we'll say again, and that means no exceptions. No exceptions. That's why Jesus had to die for every person in history, past, present, and future. The, on Tuesday, we noted Romans 3.11, and this contained the second and third charges. And in this, in the second charge actually uh, states that there's absolute, absolutely no one in the human race who comprehends the character and nature of God or his will or his ways. And also the third charge, sta- third charge states that there's no one who diligently seeks after learning about God or his will or his ways. Why? Because spiritually dead human beings have no capacity to seek after God. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, I was seeking after God. No, you were not, and neither was I. You were doing your own thing like I was doing my own thing. It was God that was chasing you down, like he chased Paul down, who thought he was serving God. And he knocked Paul off his high horse on the road to Damascus. And he saw the risen Christ and believed in him. God was seeking after us. Spiritually dead people have no capacity to seek after God. God has to seek after them. And that's what we studied. We studied that on Wednesday evening. We studied that there's absolutely no one in the human race who seeks after God. But thank God, God takes the initiative and seeks after man. 
This was illustrated, as we saw on Wednesday, in Genesis chapter 3, where God sought after Adam and the woman after they fell. What did they do? They ran and hid. They were condemned in their conscience. They knew they disobeyed God, and they had a guilty conscience, and they ran away from God. And that's what people do in the human race. So God might be using you as a believer to seek after one of those people, those lost sheep. He could be using you. God will use whatever circumstances, people, blessings, anything necessary to cause the, the, the unbeliever to have the humility to listen to the gospel, to make a decision to either accept or reject Jesus Christ. Now this morning we're going to note, we're going to note verse 12, Romans 3.12 in detail. And in this passage, Paul's going to give us the fourth, fifth, and sixth charges and a 13-count indictment against the entire human race. So look at Romans chapter 3, verse 10, with that introduction. It says in Romans 3.10, As it is written, and that's in the Old Testament, that's why in most of your Bibles they have a, they capitalize the letters, that's because he's quoting Scripture. And here he's going to quote Psalm 14, 1 through 3. There's none righteous, he says, <clears throat> not even one. There's none who understands, of course, God he's talking about. There's none who seeks for God. All, and here's our passage this morning, all have turned aside. Together, they, the entire human race, both Jew and Gentile, have become useless. Useless for God's purpose. There's none who does good. Now, this is good that is in, in, according to God's standards. There's not even one who does good. Now Paul, again, he's quoting in, in verse 12, Psalm 14, verse 3. All have turned aside, it says in this passage, they have together become corrupt, the human race. There's no one who does good, not even one. Now, in our passage it says, all have turned aside. All is used in a distributive sense. It's the adjective pos. That's what it looks like there in the Greek on the board. It's used in a distributive sense. That means that each and every member of the human race, male, female, Jew, Gentile, rich man, poor man, slave or free man, every member of the human race, without exception, is physically alive, yet spiritually dead having absolutely no capacity whatsoever to obey God and thus have a relationship with Him. When it says, have turned aside, when I was looking at this in the original text, it's a fascinating word. It's the word eklino. It's a compound word. And it means to turn aside, to deviate from the way of living that God designed for mankind. Now, God has a... God, if God is being the creator of man... He's the one who designed the way that man should live, which basically mirrors his, the way he lives. So what God's, God, uh, what God's saying to us here in his word through the Holy Spirit is that the entire human race has deviated, turned aside from the way of living that God designed for mankind. By diso and how do they do that? disobeying his commands and prohibitions that appear in his word, and this results in living independently of him, which constitutes evil and rebellion. All the human race is, got, is doing their own thing. You and I were like that. Now, God's given us his word, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the new nature of Christ that's in us, the indwelling of the Trinity, Trinity that's permanently Dwell in your body, all three members of the Trinity, and dwell your body, the Bible teaches. The Father, Ephesians 4, 5, is indwelling your body. Romans 8, 11 says that also the Holy Spirit's indwelling your body. And also, uh, God the Son is indwelling your body, uh, Colossians 1, 27. And there are many other passages which teach the indwelling of the Trinity. So you have the capacity to live according to God's standards, to learn His Word. The human race doesn't have that capacity yet. They have to believe in Christ to gain the capacity to live according to God's way of living. And the world lives independently. And who's the God of this world, as we've seen many times? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it's the devil. And the devil's sin was not, uh, was not uh, a homosexuality. His sin was not any kind of uh, a crime that we would think of violent crime. What he did was, he said, I'm going to live independently of you, God with the five great I wills of Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. 
So evil is not just uh, immorality or murder. Evil is anything that is independent of God, and in particular, independent of what his word teaches. So there are a lot of things people are doing in the world that are good things, but their motivation is all wrong. They're doing it to gain the approbation of people. They're doing it out of guilt, or whatever reason it may be. But God only rewards that which is done with proper motivation, out of love and appreciation for him, and obedience to his word. And so what we see is the world has their own way of doing things. We have our own views <clears throat> on relationships between men and women. Uh, we think that uh, homosexuality and lesbianism is an alternative lifestyle. That's what the world thinks. That's not what the Bible says. It's not an alt- the only, that's not the, uh, an alternative lifestyle. That's not the lifestyle God approves of. Uh, there's, uh, there's many things, lying, cheating, stealing, all those things are not according to God's way of doing things. Yet isn't our lives and the people we come in contact with and uh, the businesses and, and people, and, and there's injustice, there's lying, cheating, stealing, stealing, conspiracy, gossiping, backstabbing people. That's the world's way of doing things. Doing things for, because I want to get a, a noticed by people. Doing things because of other people. And, and get, trying to get their approval rather than God's approval. That God disapproves of. And the reason why the world's a mess today is you can't blame God. It's because the human race has rejected God. They've rejected the revelation of him in creation. Creation says there's a God we've seen. So the atheist is basically in denial. There's also the in, inherently every one of us has a moral code written into our souls by Jesus Christ. Even unbelievers have this. That's why when they get guilty, when they commit a crime, that's a manifestation of this moral code. And then there's also the Son of God incarnate that the world rejected by crucifying him. And then there's the Word of God, which people are rejecting today and, re- and trying to, uh, and ridiculing. And people who teach the Bible, and the people who listen to the Bible are taught. You're ridiculed. You're in the minority, people. So this word in Romans 3.12 talks about the human race deviating from the way that God had designed for man, the way of living that God had designed for all men. And God's way is the right way. If you really want to have true happiness and true joy and contentment, it's learning God's word and learning. by doing that, you're learning his way of living that has been prescribed for you. He's the creator. He knows what's best for his creation, his, cre- his creatures. Uh, for instance, your cars are designed to run on gas. All right? And if you put milk in those gas tanks, you got problems. Well, the human race is running around with milk in their gas tank. Well, they can't do anything. They're like Fred Flintstone now, running around, you know? And we are, the gasoline to a, as gasoline is to a car, so the word of God is to us as creatures of God. Now, the way of the Lord refers to the manner or or the way in which the Lord does things, which is based upon his character and nature, and it's expressed by his acts of righteousness and justice towards both men and angels. The way of the Lord is righteousness, and this righteousness is revealed in his commands, his prohibitions, and these commands and prohibitions that are found in his word are, are, are summarizing the Bible. They can be summarized, all his commands... All his prohibitions, what he want, requires of us, can be summarized as loving God with our entire being and loving our neighbor as ourself, or in other words, treating other people as you would have them treat you. The believer lives in the way of the Lord or in the manner in which he prescribes by obeying the word of God, and in particular, obeying the commands to love God with one's entire being and one's neighbor as oneself And this summarizes, again, the scriptures. How anybody can ever do God's will without emphasizing the word of God is beyond me. How any church could ever do God's will as a church, as a local assembly, without emphasizing the word of God is beyond me. In fact, they've been deceived. You know, in many seminaries today, of the major denominations, they reject that God's word is inspired by God. They reject the Bible is inspired by God. You can, you can tell if somebody's got it by their attitude toward the Word of God. Do they believe it's inspired by God? Or do they think it's just a book of men, by, that men wrote? 
It's a supernatural book. Fulfilled prophecy demonstrates it. So we see that you and I learn to live in the way of the Lord by learning his word and putting it into practice. Doesn't it say in Matthew 7, 12, in everything Jesus said, everything we do in life, at home, on the job, in our church, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you would want them to treat you. For th- look what he says, for this is the law and the prophets. What is the law and the prophets? For those of you who have been following along faithful to the teaching, that's a description of the Old Testament Bible, Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets. He says this is the law and the prophets, or in other words, this summarizes the law and prophets. It, treat people the way you'd want to be treated, the golden rule, right? Isn't it interesting in our, in our society, haven't we gone away from that? We have, and many, and we're going further and further, drifting further and further away from that. The Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he called himself the way. Doesn't it say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So in order to learn the way God wants us to live, we got to go to Jesus and his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 1 Corinthians 2.12, or 2.16, we have the mind of Christ, the Bible. Not just the red letters, the entire scripture is the mind and thinking of Jesus Christ. And it reveals the Father's will to us. Now the fact that the entire human race has rejected God's way of righteousness is spoken of throughout the scriptures. Look at some of these passages in Isaiah 53, 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned aside to his own way, his own way of living, his own way of doing things. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hey, the human race is like teenagers. They get to a certain age and... All of a sudden, you adults become stupid, right? All of a sudden, I ain't too smart anymore. Heck, kid, I've been around this planet a lot longer than you. Now, how could you possibly know how to live? But all of a sudden, you become stupid. Why? Because, the, like the human race, teenagers go, I know how to do things the right way. I know how to do things. I want to do things my way. I want to, do, I want to live independently of you. I want, to do, I want to have my own rules. I want to come home when I want to and go out with my friends. That's just like the human race. They say to God, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I don't care what you have to say. So that rebelliousness that we see in our teenagers, not all teenagers are rebellious, I think, but many of them are. I know I was. And that's just a manifestation of the sin nature. And we have to rein that in with rules and regulations that are based upon love for them. I say, don't stay out till 11. I don't want you to go into a car with strange kids uh, driving around drinking because I love you. I'm not telling you to say no because I'm trying to hurt you. I'm trying to protect you so you don't end up in a morgue somewhere. So when your parents say that, they they say, because I love you. God does the same thing to the human race. Yet the human race says, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to do things my way. And that's why we have so much misery in our world. But look what it says. Thank God did something. God did something about it. The Lord has laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 59, verse 8. The way of peace... They, the human race, do not know. There's no justice in their paths. Why is the world always at war? And why will there be wars, as Jesus said, and rumors of war right to the day he comes back at the second advent, which ends the tribulation period? Why? Because the human race, wants everybody wants to do their own thing, and that's why nations clash, that's why families clash, that's why individuals clash, because everybody is not listening to the Lord's way of doing things. Not everybody is living according to God's standards. So he says, they, they uh, the way of peace they do not know. There's no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. And then Ecclesiastes 7.29, God made mankind upright, not like a chimp. You, weren't, you never came from a chimp. If that was the case, then why aren't we right, running around with some of us with tails? I know some of us, when we take our shirt off, we look like we have the missing link. But this is, God has made mankind upright. God has made mankind upright. Evolution says the opposite, right? Well, that's the world's opinion. God made mankind upright, but look what it says. But men have gone in search of many schemes. 
One day we're going to study the book of Ecclesiastes. And that book is all about trying to live life independently of God. And Solomon, the wisest man in the ancient world, son of King David, tried all kinds of tests. Oh, maybe if I have a lot of sex, I'll be happy. Maybe if I try to just make a lot of money, I'll be happy. Uh, Maybe if I just read a lot and try to gain all this wisdom of the world, that I'll be happy. And he couldn't find anything to make him happy except God's word and having a relationship with God. Israel was commanded to keep the way of righteousness and warn what would happen to them if they forsook it. And what happened to them? They were disciplined by God and they were kicked out of the land on three different occasions, the last of which they finally arrived back in the land in 1948 and that's a a harbinger, that's a a, a precursor to the fact that the tribulation period, the events of the tribulation period are almost all in place for the tribulation period to come to pass. Deuteronomy 8.6 says, Therefore, to Israel he says this, You shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk, Walk means live your life, your lifestyle, to walk in his ways and to fear him. Israel, of course, rejected the way of the Lord through their practice of unrighteousness. Isaiah 65, 2, I have spread out my hands. This is God saying to the human race, in particular Israel, I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk what? In the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. The way of righteous and the way of the wicked are spoken of throughout the, the, uh, the Old Testament. There's a comparison between God's attitude toward the ones who walk in His way and the ones that walk independently of Him. It says in Psalm, one, uh, Psalm verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It says in Proverbs 15, 9, The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but He loves one who pursues righteousness, loving God and loving each other. Proverbs 10, 29, the way of the Lord is a stronghold for the upright, but ruin to the workers of iniquity. The psalmist, how do you you learn the way God wants us to live? How do we learn the ways of God? How do we learn through the word of God? You cannot separate that from the way of the Lord. You learn about the way of the Lord. Through his word. It says in Psalm 143 verse 8. Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning. For I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk. For to you I lift up my soul. Psalm 32 verse 8. I will instruct you, God says, and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will counsel you with an eye upon you. When I was about 19... I made a total mess of my life. I had a great childhood, great parents, and made a, you don't need to know what the details were. I didn't murder anybody, okay? But what happened was, I totally made a mess of my life. Thought I could, had it together, and 19 totally wrecked my life. Messed up my life, miserable. And it was only when I believed in Christ and I started to learn His Word that I started to get my, slowly but surely, started to get my act together. Now, I haven't arrived, and I'm not perfect. I fail many in many ways. But I can tell you this. For those of you who might be sitting on the fence and thinking, geez, should I really be a disciple of the Word of God? Should I really learn God's Word and give everything and love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and my neighbor as myself? Should I give everything to my... Yes. I can tell you and many other people in this room can tell you that God's Word can really clean up all the fears. It will clean up all the, the heartaches. It will heal you. And it will show you the right way to go in life so that you can really have true joy and happiness. It can teach you how to raise your kids. It can teach you how to love your husband and how to love your wife. It can teach you how to have a great marriage. It can teach you how to have a great business that honors God. It can teach you all these things. The Bible is the most amazing book, and the greatest times in my life were not sitting down to dinner with a beautiful model. You think you never sat down with a beautiful model? I did one time, believe it or not. Even though I was bald, I wasn't bald then. But those weren't the greatest times. It wasn't the greatest time in 2004 when my beloved Red Sox won the World Series finally. And what those Yankees, I was going to say that other word. My apologies to Sharon, who's a Yankee fan. I, I was rejoicing, but those were not the greatest moments in my life. You know what the greatest moments in my life? 
in my private study, learning the Word of God into the original language, learning all these things about God's Word, and also teaching you the Word of God, fellowshipping in your Word. I've been the happiest moments of my life. I'm the happiest, and I forget about myself, and I'm totally unaware of myself when I'm into God's Word. I'm totally aware of Him. The Bible is God's love letters. Ladies, you know what it is to be in love. Men, many of you, and what is you? They're your everything. You just focus on them. You're in, when you're in love, you focus on them. Well, that's God's word. Gives you the mind of the, the one who loves you. It's his love letters, and God wants you to be in love with him. That's the greatest love there is. The highest, the love of the greatest virtue is not between men and women. It's between God and man. It says in Psalm 25, verse 12, Who is the man who fears the Lord? How do you know if somebody respects him? God says. He will instruct him in the way he should choose. It's the person who obeys his word, learns it and obeys it. That's the person who respects him. Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way he should, they should go. Now look at Romans 3.12 again, please. Let's look at another charge against the human race. So we've seen that all have deviated, turned aside from the way God has prescribed for them to live as their creator. Now he has another charge against them. Look, he says, all have turned aside. Together, they have become useless. Now this is interesting. That phrase, they have become useless, is the word akreao. It's composed of the alpha prefix, which means without, And the noun krea, which means use, need, necessity. The word literally means to render useless, unserviceable. In our passage, this verb, akreo, akreo, excuse me, means that as a result of the entire human race deviating from the way of, of God's righteousness by rejecting the word of God, they have become useless and fulfilling the creator's purpose for them, which is to love and serve and worship him. Hey, a cow's happy, a, a, a dairy cow is happiest when he's being used, when he or she or she is being used for milk. Okay, uh, uh, my guitar is perfect when it's when I'm not playing golf, but when I'm playing music. Human beings, a racehorse, a racehorse, a thoroughbred is perfect when it's running around a track, right? But you can't use it as a plow horse. A plow horse would not fulfill the purpose for which it's on this earth by running in a race. Human beings were designed to love, worship, and serve God. That's when we're happiest. The plow horse is not happy running around a racetrack, but when he's plowing, when he's being used for that. The sh- every creature that God has ever created has a certain purpose. And you and I were designed to rule over the works of God's hands. And that's when we're happiest. But God says in Romans 3.12, the entire human race, they're useless to him because they don't want to do things the way he wants them to do it. So therefore, they can't fulfill the purpose for which he created them. So what is the first purpose that God created us? To love him. If To love God is to obey him. John 14.15, if you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. Now, you know you love Jesus not by saying it verbally, but you have to walk the talk. Are you doing what he tells you to do? That tells you if you love him. If you obey his word, you do it. And when you screw up, confess it as he says in his word, First John 1, 9, and then do what he tells you to do. So mankind doesn't love God. Mankind has no capacity to love or obey God because, again, of that old sin nature which produces mental, verbal, and overt acts of sin through the function of volition. Therefore, since mankind has no capacity to love or obey God, they have no capacity to worship and serve Him, which is based upon obedience to Him as an expression of love for Him. So the human race, because they don't have the capacity to love God and therefore to serve Him and worship Him, they become useless to God. Mankind... You and I were created to rule over the works of God's hands. Doesn't it say in Genesis 1.26 about the first two human beings, Adam and the woman, Adam and Esha, that was her name. She was called Eve when she had kids. She, well, that wasn't her original name. Her original name was Esha in the Hebrews, Hebrew. And then she was, became Eve, the mother of all living, after they had children, after the fall. Next, God decreed. Look at it says in Genesis 1.26. 
God decreed, let us model man in our image. Us, referring to the Trinity. According to our likeness. And the real you, is God invisible? Yes, he's spirit. The real you is, the real, hum, the real essence of humanity is in the soul. You can't see that. Just like God, you can't see God, he's spirit. Human beings are created in that image. Invisible essence of man mirrors God. Consequently, he says, they will rule. Man will rule over the works of God's hands and the, over the fish and the various bodies of water and over the birds in the earth's atmosphere and over the entire earth and over each and every creeper crawler, that's the insect kingdom, and those which crawl upon the earth. The rulership of creation, as we saw in the book of Genesis, was lost by Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden when they disobeyed the Lord's prohibition to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mankind has therefore no capacity to fulfill God's purpose to rule over the creation because of personal sin, which again is the production of the sin nature through the function of volition. Satan usurped the, the rulership of the first Adam when he deceived the woman into disobeying the Lord's prohibition to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and getting Adam to do so as well. However, again, thanks to God's grace, the last Adam, the God-man, Jesus Christ, through his obedience and going to the cross, he has regained that rulership over the earth which Adam and the woman lost through their disobedience. And so therefore, when you believe in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you're in Christ Jesus. You're a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. You're in union with him. That means the father looks at you as he looks at his son and you are seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father, in a position of power and authority, when you go to God in prayer, you should be aware of that. That's what it means when you pray in Jesus' name. That means you're consciously aware that you're in a position of power and victory because of who Christ is, not because of who you are. You, the devil shakes and the demons shake in their boots when they look at you and you're aware of that. And they try to cut the Christian off from the, hearing the word of God so that they won't know that, so that they won't experience the power of God in their life and the joy of the Lord in their life. They cut them off from going to Bible class, learning the word, and so therefore he just gets the, the, the church ignorant of, of their position and power so that he can gain an advantage in the world. You were designed to rule over the works of God's hands and we are going to reign over the works of God's hands in Christ's millennial reign. And if the rapture were to happen tonight, people, that's, that, that rapture happened at night, the tribulation begins, and at the end, it's tribulation is seven years, Christ comes back at the second advent with the church and the angels. Revelation 19, 11 through 19 teaches that and he will establish this as millennial reign. Could, so it could, be about, it could be about seven or eight years away. And we'll be in resurrection bodies. And those of us who are faithful to the Lord in this life and executed the Father's plan and grew to spiritual maturity, you will be the overcomer and you will, some of you will have reign over certain cities in Christ's millennial government. The Word of God promises that. Don't live for this world. It's passing away. Everything you see here is going to burn. The Bible says. New heavens and a new earth. So why live for the things of this world? Live for the world to come. Live your life in light of eternity and in light of these things. Don't buy the lie that money and status and position and approbation from people is what it's all about. It's a lie. Look at, ver- look at verse 12 again. We're near the end here. It says in, in Romans 3.12, All have turned aside... Together they have become useless. And then it says, there's none who does good. There's not even one. Good is the word Christotes. It's used with reference to unsaved humanity. That's what unregenerate means. And it describes, this word describes having a tender, compassionate concern for others. And this is reflected in a desire to treat them with compassion. Now Paul says, there's no one in the human race that does that. Romans 3.12 says, Paul teaches that there's absolutely no one in the human race that practices tender, compassionate concern for others as reflected in the desire to treat them with compassion. 
Now, I know you're, some of you are saying, but listen to me. Of course, members of the human race do practice kindness or compassion towards other human beings, but not according to God's perfect holy standards, since God exercises tender, compassionate concern for his enemies, whereas unsaved humanity, they don't do that. God does that. Human beings will show compassion towards family members and those who are attracted to them. Even gangsters are good to their family. I was watching this guy on television. He's a, an unbelievable murderer. Cold-blooded murderer. He was a hitman for the mob. In jail now. I think he's called the... I forget what the heck his name is called. But they interviewed him and they got a psycho thing on him. But he treats his kids... He, he doted over his kids. He's like murderer. Even... Unbelievers treat their kids good. Even gangsters do that. Human beings will show compassion towards family members and those who are attractive to them or to those they desire something from, such as love. But it is not in man's sinful nature to practice compassion towards those who are antagonistic towards him. Let me show you we'll, one, a couple more passages and we'll wrap it up here. We're almost done here. Look, go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Matthew 5, 43, quickly. First Gospel, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. This is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Great discourse. Matthew 5, 43. Look at it says. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, Jesus is not quoting the Old Testament. That's not the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach hate your enemy. That's what the... Judaizers, that's what the Pharisees used to teach, the rabbis. Jesus taught the exact opposite. Look what he says. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Didn't Jesus do that on the cross? Father, forgive them, you know not what they do. So that why does he want them to do that? Why does he want us to do that? Instead of getting mad at somebody who persecutes you at work, pray for them. That's spiritual. Treat them better than they deserve, like God treated you and me better than we deserve. Why does he want us to do that? So that you might be sons or manifest the fact that you're sons of your Father who is in heaven. Why? Look at God, the way God treats the human race. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. He's still letting the unbeliever enjoy this beautiful day and the rain and the food and the shelter and clothing and they, they, they hate his Son. That's God's perfect standards. I treat those who don't deserve it, I treat them well. Think about Satan. He didn't throw him in the lake of fire immediately. He gave Satan a reprieve. Human history is his appeal trial. Satan's not going to be thrown in the lake of fire until at the, at the end of human history. That's love. He's allowing this guy, to ex, an angel to, who's antagonizing him, attacking his people, and yet he lets him live. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even unbelievers do that. Look, he says, do not even tax collectors do the same? And the Jews hated the tax collectors because the tax collectors were Jewish men who went over to the Romans and collect taxes for the Romans and the Jews hated the Romans. Remember, Israel in Jesus' day was occupied by the Romans. So they were despised. They won't even let their daughters have uh, uh, marry them. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more, what more are you doing than, the, than others? Do not even the Gentiles, the unbelievers, do the same? Therefore, you're to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God exercised kindness or compassion towards his enemies. And that, that's you and I, the human race people. And that he sent his son to the cross to die for them and as their substitute, while they were yet his enemies. That's true compassion and love. One more passage and we'll end. Romans 5, chap, chapter 5, verse 6. Romans 5, 6.
Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless, spiritually dead, before we were saved, that's us, helpless and hopeless. Just like a little infant who's got messed pants. <laughs> okay? You wives and husbands, know what, we have kids, know what I'm talking about. Helpless and hopeless. That little thing is just helpless and hopeless, all right? That's us. That's the human race. Poop in the pants, right? As you say, my nephew, pooped in the pants. For while we were still helpless at the right time, 2,000 years ago at Calvary, Christ died for the ungodly. All of us were unbelievers at one time. That's what he's talking about. Everyone. For one, look what he says, for one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love. It's unique to him. He demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he's holy. We were his enemies. Christ died for us. He died for Hitler. He died for the child molester. Yes. He died for the self-righteous, legalistic Pharisee. He died for you. He died for me. He died for all men. He died for the entire human race, was totally antagonistic to him, could care less about him, but he went after them. He initiated. God's love initiates. God's love seeks to reconcile. God treats the unlovely in grace and love and compassion, and that's what the love God wants us to do. So the next time someone wounds you, treat them the way Jesus treated you and the Father treated you when you were his enemy. The next time someone wounds you or hurts you, Forgive them as God in Christ has forgiven you. Treat them better than they deserve. That, see, this is what Paul's saying in Romans 3.12. The human race doesn't do this. They don't live according to the way God loves and is God has compassion. They don't live to that, those standards because human beings only treat well those who they love or they want something from. It's a selfish love. God's love is unselfish. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work and challenge us with the things that we've heard this morning. We thank you for everyone that is here. We just thank you, Father, for your word and the Spirit. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us, guide us and instruct us in the passages and principles we've noted this morning. Transform us, Father, through your word and the Spirit so that we can become just like you and operating in that same love, loving our enemies, praying for them, praying for those who persecute us, forgiving each other when we... We're wronged by people who seek to hurt us or our families. Help us to do that, Father, and reflect the very love that you and your, your son reflected at the cross. So, Father, we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Could our ushers come forward for the Sunday morning offering, please? And Eric, could you please? Now, if you're visiting, please listen to me. If you're visiting, uh, put away your wallet, put away your billfold. Uh, this is not a, I'm not I'm not kidding around. I'm just serious. Put it away. Put your wallet. Put your purse away. We're just glad that you're here, and we hope you enjoyed the service. This offering is for those who consider me their pastor and this their church, and that they think that uh, the Spirit is guiding them and to give. And this giving, of course, is be done with proper motivation. Uh, if you don't feel like, don't give. If you don't feel like giving or you don't feel moved to give by the Holy Spirit, just keep it in your wallet because you're not going to get any credit from God if you give it with a, you know, I don't, you know, like maybe I'll put it in. All right? I don't really don't want to. Well, they hang on to it, you know. And it's nobody's business what you give. Nobody's keeping tabs on what. You, we're not going to have a big, uh, you know, thing on the board saying, oh, so-and-so gave here and embarrass you and all that other baloney that churches do. That's disgraceful. We're not going to do that. This is between you and God, and so let's pray for this offering. Father, we just pray that this offering would be given with proper motivation, out of love and appreciation for, for you, Father, in the body of Christ. We pray that the givers would be blessed, and we just pray, Father, that you guide them what they want uh, to give, and we thank you for those who have been so faithful in giving to this ministry. So, Father, we pray for this offering in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
upon a cold Roman cross. He hung between heaven and earth, separated from his father for those last three hours to reconcile a world that was lost. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Upon a cold Roman cross, God showed His love by giving His Son the sacrifice. For you and I that gave us life eternal, we were redeemed by the blood of His cross. He was forsaken. The Romans placed a crown of thorns upon His head. They pierced His feet and hands and watched Him as He bled. Soldiers gambled for his clothes and mocked him to his face. Crucified between two thieves, and yet he gave them grace. Father, forgive them; they know not what they do. Upon a cold Roman cross, he hung between heaven and earth, separated from his father for those last three hours to reconcile a world that was lost. He was forsaken. And at the stroke of noon, darkness filled the land. The time had finally come to crush this sinless man. The father forsook his son so we could be redeemed. The crowd around him stood and heard his anguish as he screamed, "The grain of wheat." Fell in to the ground. Up on a cold Roman cross, God showed His love by giving His Son the sacrifice for you and. I that gave us life eternal, we were redeemed by the blood of His cross. He was forsaken. Oh, He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Who? He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. You just missed.